At this point, we're going to turn to the defense closing argument. Mr. Eisenhower, when you are ready, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. He knew where the shooter or shooters were located? That's not what the evidence showed. Saying it's so, don't make it so. So let's just jump right into his transmissions. His transmissions corroborate what he told Detective Curcio two days after the shooting, when he wasn't a suspect, when there was no internal affairs complaint, when he was just a witness to a homicide. And he told Detective Curcio, I didn't know precisely where the shooter or shooters were located. In real time, if he knew where the shooter or shooters were located, why is he saying at 2.29.02, Perry, Deputy Perry, we learned that from his testimony, does he, the injured Kyle Lamons who was with him, does he know where the shooter is? Why is he asking that if he knew? If he knew precisely that the shooter or shooters were located inside the 1200 building and not by inside or around the area, why right before that is he asking at 228, do not approach the 12 or 1300 building? If it's just the 1200 building, that's something different. Why at 245.25, something that was not even on her board, not on the state's board, because they don't want you to know that over 18 <coughs> minutes later, he's still saying, between the 12 and 1300 building is the last time we heard shots. Two dozen witnesses came in here one by one and told you they couldn't tell from the sounds precisely what area we are talking about. The best you can do is narrow it down to that general area around the 1200 building. Their entire case hinges upon this erroneous belief that he knew that there were kids in that 1200 building being shot <coughs> by this monster. And that wasn't proven because it didn't happen. Now I want to take a step back and remind you why we're here. It can get lost as the prosecution continues to point their finger at a 32-year veteran, honorable, decorated, award-winning. Everyone who testified talked about how wonderful of a human being he was. Out of 3,200 kids on that campus, they didn't find one to come in here and say something derogatory about him. Well, he was lazy. He didn't assist us. Not one teacher, not one faculty member, not one, because he truly was extraordinary. 32 years, and then 4 minutes and 15 seconds, he becomes a felon. We're here because of that monster. That's why we're here. He chose to commit one of the most abhorrent acts ever. He changed all of our lives. 17 people killed. 14 were children. 17 injured. He did it. And one of the carnage, the extended carnage, is that a man is sitting over here fighting for his liberty. Yeah, that's sustained. Go ahead. This is a criminal case. This is not an administrative hearing. Let's talk about Judge you take it down one second. Let's talk numbers because that is not in dispute, just so we have the parameters. <coughs> the shooter was inside the twelve hundred building for six minutes and thirty six seconds. For approximately the first two minutes, my client wasn't even at the scene. 
That's very important because the state still had testimony from people on the first floor to appeal to sympathy, obviously. Objection, Judge. That's an attack on the prosecution. Uh, that's overruled. Again, ladies and gentlemen, these closing arguments are meant to assist you in your really? determination of the facts. Uh, but you're going to decide what the facts of the case are, what the lawyers say is not evidence. Go ahead, sir. He wasn't even at the scene on the first floor until he hears the shots of Aaron Feist. Aaron Feist was shot at 2.23.25. That is not in dispute. 2.23.25. One second later, my client gets on his police radio and announces, be advised, we have possible, could be firecrackers. Understand that the four minutes and 15 seconds, the time that he has to do something, begins with him trying to sort out, wait, I thought we were talking about firecrackers. So at first, click, 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 seconds running down, possible, could be firecrackers. I think we have shots fired, possible shots fired, 1200 bill. He's giving his location. And he's telling people to respond to that area. He doesn't say inside the 1200 building. And the Peterson rule from now on with all law enforcement is going to be to get on the radio and say, when I say 1200 building, let me make very clear, I'm not saying inside. I'm saying the area around. You see, I'm not really sure. It's ludicrous to suggest that when he says 1200 building, that what he means is definitively inside the 1200 building. That's not what he's saying. And he never definitively and clearly says inside the 1200 building. His first reaction is 1200 building because he's literally standing 10 feet from the 1200 building. Now they could condemn him all he wants that he doesn't walk up and open up the door, but the shots rang out as he was 10 feet from the door. Him and Kelvin Greenleaf were standing there, they were approaching, and then the shots rang out. And it was shocking and it was jarring for everyone. No, he didn't say, hold on one second. Let me walk a few feet, open up the door and look in, because that's not how things went down. He immediately felt that he was in jeopardy. So did Kelvin Greenleaf. They didn't know where the shots were coming from. And we're going to go ahead and play now what happened. What you're going to notice was he doesn't immediately run to shelter. 2.25, the shots ring out. You will see him on the screen again. At 2.23.44, another 18 seconds later, he remains, give me one second, he remains right by the 1200 building. Thinking of himself, no. Thinking of the kids in that building, yes, because he doesn't run for cover. He stands there out in the open with Kelvin Greenlee, fearing that there could be sniper fire, random people running around with guns, bullets from any direction. You understood he wasn't the only one who said that. Every single cop is trained to believe that all that is possible. So to his credit, he stands there with no vest on. Yeah, that's the reason why we brought it up. He didn't say, hold on one second. Let me go run to my vehicle, put on my vest, and get my rifle. He stands there, vulnerable as you can be, risking his life, and gets on the radio and yells, shots fired, because every second does matter. He stands there and he yells, shots fired. We're going to see the delay in how long it took. A good 18 seconds before he gets back to a position of cover. That's 18 seconds he could have been hit by fire. And he stood there and not only gets on his radio and announces shots fired, but gets on his school radio and orders a code red. We'll talk more about that in a moment. Let's take a look. Mr. Savisky, this is attorney three. Yes. Could it be disrupted by the wireless? Could be.
So we just started at 2.23.25 after Aaron Price was shot. Medina drives away. And you don't see Scott or Calvin Greenleaf until, take a look, 2.23.44. Pause it for a second. Go back just a little bit. The other thing I want you to see is, it's not just Calvin Greenleaf who's pointing. Oh yeah, stop it right there. Look who's pointing. He's yelling. My client's concern right away is, get back, get back. And remember when Ms. Ren Remy testified, Renny Remy, one of the teachers, she heard my client say, get back, get back. His concern is for the kids in that building. He's, that's him gesturing, get back, both Kelvin Greenleaf and my client, saying get back into the 700 building. Why? If the shots are contained within the 1200 building, and my client somehow knows that, those kids are not in danger. No sniper fire, no harm, no nothing. He gets them back in there because he is extremely concerned that now this whole hot zone becomes an area where he and everybody else could be harmed. He doesn't know that there's one shooter. Nobody knows that. We have the luxury in this courtroom of hindsight. Hindsight's 2020. Monday morning quarterbacking. There's phrases for it. And when you're in the hot zone, like my client was, going through adrenaline dumps like we heard about, and the things that people were experiencing, the stress of that situation, my client is concerned about the kids. Look, he's got his hands up and he's gesturing. Keep going, please. Pause for a moment. So we know up to this point, he risks his life by standing there for 18 seconds and reporting shots fired, possible shots fired, firecrackers. I think we have shots fired, possible shots fired, 1200 building. He's also on his school radio ordering a code red. We know that because Anna Ramos came in here via Zoom and she couldn't have been more credible, believable, and honest. She was extremely grateful to Scott for ordering the code red because it saved lives. Imagine if he didn't order the code red. You got more kids exposed and outside of their classrooms. As a result of him ordering the code red, him doing that, which was corroborated by Jeffrey Morford, he also heard his voice, it saved lives. Imagine, and he would have been justified in saying, oh my gosh, there's possible shots fired. I'm going to take a few minutes and run to my car to get a vest. Everyone else did. Every other cop put on a vest and had their gun. Their, their long rifle. Not a pistol, but a long rifle. He didn't. He stays there exposed. And look, he's standing in the open because these radios stink. The state's missing the point. The radio problem existed way before this shooting. At this school, we heard testimony from numerous people that Scott always had problems with his BSO radio. Constantly, you had to literally leave the building to get reception. He's risking his life without a vest, not knowing where the shots next are going to be coming from, to ensure that those critical dispatch announcements get out there. So instead of thanking Scott for doing that. We're prosecuting him. We're prosecuting him. He could have stayed behind the wall and risked his transmissions not getting out with those radios. They, they don't want you to believe that there was a problem with the radios until somehow later into the shooting. That was not supported by the evidence, just the opposite. Multi people, te we had numerous people testify that in Parkland especially, those radios were horrible. They were antiquated. Ms. Mize talked about 25 to 30 years. Outdated technology before the shooting ever started and certainly when the shooting did. And Scott, risking his life standing there. Now we do know he later takes a low position of cover and he's looking. But right at the beginning to get out those critical announcements, Scott is risking his life to stand out there. That is uncontroverted. There's no other reason why he's putting himself in that harm. We're all set. We're all set. I want to take a breather and thank you. I'm going to get hot in just a moment again, too, but I've got to take a, just a breather for a second. I asked 
all of you during jury selection a lot of things. One of them would be, would you hold it against my client if I fought like heck for him? You know, where I, I just was passionate and I cross-examined witnesses and even got to the point where sometimes even the judge would have to sustain objections even though the judge doesn't favor one side or another. He's going to tell you that. Would you hold it against my client if I became very zealous and passionate? You all said you wouldn't. That was one of the many promises that you made to us that led to you making the cut from the hundreds and hundreds that we interviewed. Why else are you here? Because you all swore that you could follow certain cherished legal principles that protect not just Scott Peterson, but every single one of us if we're ever accused of any offense, including a speeding ticket. And that starts with the presumption of innocence. Remember I had Scott stand up. You can look over at Scott again, too, if you want, like I did in jury selection. But like, look at him. Does he remind you of an ex-boyfriend that bothers you? Does he remind you of a cop who maybe harassed you or gave you a ticket? You all said, no, no, I'm cool with it. And I will presume or believe that he is innocent. And I challenged you. And a lot of the jurors went bye-bye, potential jurors. Because I said, really? You can truly presume or believe he didn't do something to be here after four years of them filing an information on a computer, a charging document on a computer? You sure? Well, I guess, yeah, you make a point, Mr. Aguilar. I mean, he probably did something. Okay, bye-bye, thank you. Maybe there's a DUI case down the hall with your name on it. That's fine. But this case required people to look over and presume and believe that he's innocent. And I challenged you. I said, well, have you ever seen anyone on the side of the road being arrested? Or on television, on the news, you see somebody arrested. How many of you actually say, why are they arresting that sweet, innocent person? Very few of us. Judge, at this time I'm going to object to the fact-finding evidence. This is not relevant to the fact that we're heard about that. No, it's overruled. It's a closing argument. Go ahead. So, you guys said, no, 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 we can presume and believe that he is innocent. And the only time that would change is if you heard sufficient evidence from the prosecution beyond and to the exclusion of every reasonable doubt. Not maybe he's guilty, not probably he's guilty, not 100% I think he may be guilty. It's the highest burden under the law. We're not dealing with money in this arena, folks. So you all swore that you would hold them to that burden. You also swore that you wouldn't have us prove anything, that you understood that we literally could sit there and do nothing. I knew we wouldn't do nothing. We called plenty of witnesses. And I asked a lot of questions and their responses on cross-examination. That's evidence, and we're going to go through all that. But you all swore that you could follow the law. We knew what the evidence was. You heard that we had taken depositions of all these witnesses. We knew it line by line. So all we needed was a fair jury. That's all we were praying for. And we got it in you. And so on behalf of Scott, I thank you very much for that. You also swore that you understood that we're not here for an administrative hearing. Meaning, let's determine if he violated his training. Now, I suggest to you as we go through the evidence, he did everything he could, and he didn't do anything wrong at all regarding his training. But in the worst case scenario, even if you found, well, maybe he should have done this, I don't know, we heard from some people who said he didn't do this. That's what a suspension from work would be. That would be a termination or, hey, let me have your res resignation. What they've accused him here is criminal, criminal acts that what he did that day with all of the efforts, with so far him immediately announcing that shots are fired, because that's where we are in this case so far, and ordering a code red on a school radio, risking his life standing out in the open with no vest for 18 seconds, that somehow that's criminal. That's what we're here for. So let's review the evidence, and I'll repeat what I said in opening. And I strongly believe it now, and I think the evidence shows it. Scott Peterson was sacrificed. Objection, Your Honor. Sacrificed by whom? Yeah, I'm going to object to the speaking objections, too. Not okay, objections. your objection is overruled. Your objection is overruled. Ladies and gentlemen, this is closing argument. Go ahead, sir. He 
was sacrificed. He was thrown under the bus. And it continues right now. What is not in controversy, so let's try to narrow down the focus, is this was a horrible tragedy. The parents who lost children experienced, to me, one of the, probably the worst thing a parent can go through. As a father of three kids, I cannot imagine what they went through. And some of the feelings that you're entitled to have would be frustration, because we're all citizens here in South Florida. So you wouldn't be human if you didn't have, as a result of what that monster did, feelings of frustration, anger, sadness, compassion, and demand for change. All those are very normal. But none of those feelings have any place when you're evaluating whether Scott is guilty of the offenses that they've alleged. One minute and six seconds. That's the time that my client had from the time that Aaron Feist is shot to the time that that monster gets to the third floor and begins shooting and killing the people that he's accused of neglecting. One minute and six seconds. It took a team of 12 SWAT members over 30 minutes to clear the first, second floor, and get up to the third floor. And somehow, it's pure fiction to suggest that Scott, even if he knew, and we'll focus on it, he did not know, but even if he knew that somehow he could have made a difference. That is pure fiction. So how did this start? Let's talk about what's uncontroverted. My client gave a statement. It's there. We've highlighted it for you, so you know. And then I asked Detective Curcio, so was this corroborated? Yes. Was this corroborated? Yes. This turned out to be true? Yes. This turned out to be true? Everything was, there was nothing recent. Well, hold on. Hold on. No, it turned out that wasn't true. So let's go through it. First, it was Valentine's Day, ironically. A day of love, a celebration of love. And that's when this monster chose to make it about hate. My client was in his office, as the statement reveals. He was intently working on his computer, researching the statute for when you possess a counterfeit or fake driver's license, because he had a student who possessed one. He wasn't going to arrest her. He was meeting with the father to explain to him and her how serious of an offense this was. When Greenleaf comes in and says, hey, possible fire, did you hear whatever? My client doesn't say yes because he's busy working. He didn't hear. His radio's charging in his office, and he jumps up and he says, let's go. Let's change the facts. Let's say my client said, wait, what? Firecrackers? You go deal with it. That could even be gunfire. You go deal with it. I don't want to deal with it. I'm going to stay here in the safety of my 100 building. I don't want to go all the way down there. By the way, it's far. It's like a football field or two to get all the way down there. I don't want to deal with that. I'm going to stay here. OK, that would be neglectful, I think. Right? You start to get to neglect. Not criminal neglect, because there's two different standards. We'll talk about that. But all right, no. He immediately gets up. Let's go. And then you see the video. You've seen the videos. He gets up. He starts to go out. They don't run just yet, because firecrackers, that was not uncommon, particularly on Valentine's Day. No one really took it that seriously. But the minute the fire alarm goes off, that's something different. You immediately see Scott, not walking, but running with Kelvin Greenleaf until they're picked up by Medina. Andrew Medina. Remember his name, folks? Remember when Kelvin Greenleaf testified? He made a face, and I caught it. I said, what was that face for? He talked about how Andrew Medina watched as that monster pulls up, gets out of a vehicle, walks all the way towards the 1200 building. We know how far this campus is. We know we're talking about 45 acres. How long of a walk it was to get to that building. And Medina doesn't stop him. Medina doesn't do anything. He watches. 
as he's carrying his weapons of destruction all the way into the 1200 building. And he heard shots, and he knew what he was up to. And Andrew Medina said nothing to my client or Kelvin Greenleaf. I'm not saying Andrew Medina should be facing criminal charges. That's not for me to decide. I've learned not to be that person who points their finger because I know there might be another version. I don't know. But he didn't share any of that information with Scott. If Scott knew from Andrew Medina that there was a person who Andrew Medina knew as Nicholas Cruz, they knew his history, they knew him, that crazy Cruz, they knew him. If Andrew Medina said, yeah, I saw that guy, he's wearing a burgundy ROTC shirt, black pants, he had the description. Remember, he gave that description to Burton when Officer Burton shows up at the scene. Medina knew it. He doesn't tell Scott. This case is done with. If Medina tells him, by the way, he's inside the 1200 building, and I saw him with a bag, and I heard shots right thereafter. We're done. That didn't happen. Judge. Yes, sir. Go ahead, sir. So then he gets to the building and he acts heroically by reporting what he knows. And understand this was very, very shocking because all officers talked about nothing like this had ever happened, ever. Nothing, no training, we'll get to that in a moment. Nothing prepared them for this. To sit in the calmness of a courtroom that's chilled and mellow and try to go back and Monday morning quarterback is unfair and unjust. The situation out there was much different. I'd like to go through their testimony, one by one, witness by witness, and discuss with you what each one said. And it will be clear to you, at no point you go, OK, so now we know. Now we know. And when I say we know, we're talking about the critical issue that my client knew in real time that shots were coming from inside the 1200 building and, more importantly, that kids were being killed. That's the idea that they're suggesting here. That's what they're alleging. That a man who everyone said loved those kids had a great relationship with those kids. He spent years dedicated to the protection and welfare of those children. He cared about them immensely. And they're saying, I'm just going to sit here and do nothing. Leaving out, of course, we didn't hear one word from the prosecutor that will get to it, that during that time he's sending Assistant Principal Morford to the office to watch surveillance footage to find out where the shooter or shooters are located. Why would he have done that? if he knew where the shooter or shooters were located. All right, let's, let's if I can get the... Uh... The wireless? Yeah. Let's... Judge, give me one second. This is not working. Yeah, take your time. Mr. Savitsky, you want to help him out? Please, thank you. We change the batteries and it's still okay. Okay. So let's start off again. You start off before the state calls their first witness with a presumption of innocence. Remember when the judge asked you what your verdict would be while you were, in, while you were being asked in jury selection? Not guilty, not guilty, not guilty. Okay, so the first witness comes on. It's, it's on the wire, so I don't know if you got to do the talking. 
First witness was Daniel Gilbert. Daniel Gilbert was a student on the first floor. My client wasn't there yet. They played some videos that were hard to watch because the, you know, all the kids were very tense. You can understand why they wanted to introduce that, but that offered zero value at all to the issue of whether my client knew that there was a shooter or shooters in that building. That's what we're talking about here. That's the issue. The primary issue here. So nothing. She talked about nothing that had to do with that. Next one was Ivy Shamus. She was a teacher in room 1214 on the first floor of the 1200 building. My client wasn't even there yet at all. Not sure why they called her, but I'm sure they had some value and I thought there was some value to her, but nothing. Nothing to do on the major issue in this case. Next one was Ronald Lother. They introduced him, had him introduce the videos in the case. Okay, has no first-hand knowledge of anything. And now Sergeant Heinrich. Let's talk about him. He had no problem being the first of many witnesses who the state would call to say, you're supposed to go towards the gunfire. Let's make this real easy. I've said it over and over again. We don't disagree. Cops know it. Common sense dictates it. If you know that there is a shooter in a particular location shooting kids and or adults, you go in there and you kill them. That is not in dispute. The issue is whether he knew. And the evidence fails to show it. He heard shots. He was on the campus, and he heard more shots than my client because he was there on campus when the shooter began his rampage on the first floor. So he heard all 140 shots, or had access to them. Because another issue is we heard from so many witnesses that they only heard like four to five shots. Oh, I only heard a few shots. No one came in here and testified to hearing either all 140 or if they were just there for a brief period of time, all 70 shots. Nobody heard that. Whether it be because of auditory exclusion, whether it be because of this being a hurricane-proofed building, whether it be because everybody was stressed, whether it be because the shooter's moving around in a 73-yard long building. 73 yards, three quarters of a football field. I don't think any of the state witnesses understood, because they weren't there to hear the shots, most of them, what my client was confronted with and what over two dozen people who testified were confronted with, that you couldn't tell because of the pronounced reverberation and echo in that entire area, every place, where precisely the shots were coming from. 73 yards long. And just so we're clear, the first shots that my client hears it's uncontroverted. We're going to get to him for a second, but it's uncontroverted that that was when Coach Aaron Feist was shot. I've got to bring this up because Aaron Feist was shot over 73 yards away. My client's on the east side of the building. Aaron Feist was shot on the west side. So we are literally, literally talking about Aaron Feist was thought he was around here outside of the 700 building. Cruz was inside, the door was opened, and very tragically and unfortunately, Cruz shots, shoots outside, and his body, with the door open, falls outside. It makes total sense, and even the prosecutor conceded it in her opening, in her closing argument, that it makes total sense, that it would sound like the shots are coming from outside, because the door was open, and the gun is pointing west, in an opposite direction of where my client is, all the way here at the 700 building. The clock's ticking at 4 minutes and 15 seconds when he hears shots from outside of the 700 building, the 1200 building. The door was open. Jeff Heinrich heard all the shots. He was there for all 140. And he told us that he heard five to six shots. By the way, he works for Carl Sprigs. We're going to make that distinction a lot during this closing argument. He heard five to six shots. He thought they were fireworks. And he's familiar with guns. 
He couldn't tell if it was inside or outside. Then he heard another round of gunfire. Shots were, quote, loud and banging off of things. This is their witness. This is their witness. So far, nobody has said anything that helps their case on the issue. And you've got him coming up and saying it's loud and banging. The best he could narrow it down, his words, somewhere around the 1200 to 1300 building, somewhere in that area, which is precisely, at best, where my client narrows it down. Do not approach the 12 or 1300 building. 245, 25. Between the 12 and 1300 building is the last time we heard shots. Heinrich's belief from the west side is identical to my client's belief all the way three quarters of the football field on the east side. Identical. So I asked them, where could the shots have been coming from based upon the sound that you heard? It included but wasn't limited to on the top of any of those buildings? And again, the 1300 building is also the same size as the 1200 building approximately. We're talking about 73 yards long. So you've got the 1300 building. You've got the 1300 building, which is the same size as the 1200 building. You've got the courtyard area, which we heard was about 20 yards. So you're talking about at least two football fields as a possibility, and the surrounding areas. That's Jeff Heinrich's belief, their witness, their first witness that had to deal with the major issue of this case, of sounds. OK. All right. He calls 911 and tells his dispatch, his dispatch of his real-time intelligence. This is the first time that we learn that their dispatch is not the same as BSO's. I know I just repeated that over and over again, some of the same themes, to ensure that my very intelligent jurors and detailed, because that we were looking, that's what we were looking for. I told you I needed detailed jurors, would understand that 911 cellular calls went to Carl Springs. BSO didn't get any of those calls at all. So Heinrich calls in his real-time intelligence. None of that makes it to my client, who's waiting anxiously for information. He has every reason to believe at any given moment, BSO is going to come on and say, OK, it's in the 1200 building. Or hey, go to the 1300 building. OK, it's, it never came. How could you not be extremely disturbed by that? That's not my client's fault. He's thinking any moment, like any normal call, there's going to be some real-time intelligence. Wherever this person is, there are witnesses. And there turned out to be many who called in with specific instructions on where the shooter's located. Remember that one dispatch that Carl Springs got? Classroom 1213. People down in that classroom. If my client gets that information, he's in. We're done. They never gave him that real-time intelligence. The prosecutor tells you that the best information, the best real-time intelligence is from my client? Oh, no, no. The best information came from kids who were staring at this monster. And they're watching him commit atrocities like we've never seen. They know precisely where he's located. They know what floor. They know what classroom. And none of that information went to my client. I know I'm raising my voice, folks. And every now and then, I'm going to realize it and bring it down. But how do you not get passionate about that? Sergeant Heinrich sees Aaron Feist down by the west side. My client doesn't see that. He couldn't see. He knows right outside the 1200 building, Aaron Feist was down. And what does he do? He takes a tactical position of cover. Every officer that responded to that scene, whether it be the 36-year veterans or those with less experience, all did exactly what they're trained. They take tactical positions of cover, because only in cheesy movies does the cop just walk around 
without a bulletproof vest and somehow walks like he's 10 foot tall and bulletproof. It doesn't work that way. Everybody took a position of cover. And the prosecutor in her chart conveniently calls it, even though everyone calls it a tactical position of cover, her words were, he retreats. There was another offensive expression here. Remains in a fixed position. Fixed position. Did you hear any witness call a fixed position? It was a tactical position of cover because if he gets shot, he's of no use to anyone as the first responder to that scene. He needed to stay alive. That's what every cop did. So Heinrich, the best defense witness that we could have that they called. He never went into that building. I'm not blaming him for it. He's the first of many officers who had more information than him that took positions of cover and never went in there. Which is why the most appropriate theme is he was sacrificed. He was thrown under the bus. Because why are they singling him out? Why? I'm not saying anybody should be arrested for this at all. Everyone should just learn from this experience and grow from it and be debriefed from it. We'll get to that, which they never did. But to be sacrificed, let's take the first guy on the scene, the 32-year veteran who's done everything he could, and let's sacrifice him. Because maybe they won't look at all the failures that the brass have been involved with for years. Next one, Brian Stobley. Scott was extremely professional. He heard one shot. He talked about the pronounced echo in the hallway, 700 to 800 hallways, exactly where my client was. And then you heard Mr. Killoran try to say, oh gosh, well that's a problem because that's where Scott was. Yeah, but didn't that echo just end at the hallway? So if he was standing over here for the couple seconds that he was trying at the beginning to do that as opposed to be back here, then maybe there wasn't an echo. There was such a pronounced echo everywhere in that area. We know that when we talk about our witnesses, who I'm going to talk about in a moment. Stobley believed that he was in danger standing in that area. So understand something. We have never said that my client didn't consider that one of the possibilities, one of the many possibilities, was that the shooter or shooters could have been somewhere in, around, on top of, shooting out of the, the 1200 building. But what was also his words is every time, remember when the prosecutor said, did you, did you hear when, when he said inside the 1200 building? He kept leaving out by inside the 1200 building because that's his exact words. By inside, by inside. It's over by inside the 1200 building. The prosecutor says by inside. That's not how he said it. You heard him say it. By inside. It's exactly what Burton believed. By inside. But, but understand, because the campus is so large, that encom encompasses a huge area that we're talking about. So Stobley was told by Scott, get out of the area because Scott was trying to protect Stobley's life, he thought he was in danger. And even though Stobley thought, well, it might be coming from the 1200 building, he never then turns to Scott and says, hey, I think it might be coming from inside the 1200 building. What Stobley did tell you, very credibly, is it appeared to Stobley, quote, that Scott was trying to figure out where the shots were coming from. That's his testimony in real time. One of many people, Kelvin Greenleaf will get to, it's exactly what they thought, that Scott was doing everything he could in real time to figure out where those shots were coming from. They act like they were there, but those prosecutors weren't there. Defer to those who were. Next one was Kyle Lamons, who suffered a horrific injury. Horrific. He didn't offer anything regarding whether my client knew where the shots were coming from. Next one was Ed Suarez. He was by the cafeteria. He heard firecrackers, and he said it was 
Somewhere behind him. That's the most specific he could be. Somewhere behind him. Yeah, the 1200 building was behind him. So you go, aha, Suarez knew it was 1200. Anywhere behind him, remember, just like Stabley, uh, um, Stumba, the best people could do is narrow down some geographical area. Nobody could say it was inside the 1200 building. Objection. That's your statement of facts. Uh, the objection sustained. Again, ladies and gentlemen, what the lawyers say is not evidence. Okay, I want you to rely on your memory of the evidence and the witnesses and the testimony. If the lawyers say anything and you remember it differently, I want you to rely on your own recollection of what the evidence was. Go ahead, sir. Ed Suarez, you can check your notes. Ed Suarez made it very clear. He couldn't say it was coming from inside the 1200 building. I questioned him on cross-examination. Could you say with certainty that you thought the shots were coming from inside the 1200 building? And he could not say yes to that. He did say, though, and this is important, he heard Scott Peterson on the school radio saying, please stop talking over each other. So one of the things that Scott's doing is, in real time, amongst many other things, keeping the kids from the 700 building back into their classrooms, monitoring two radios, which we heard from um, one of the school resource officers, how that can be very, very difficult. Listening to both and speaking on both and dealing with the stress. He's also telling people, hey, one at a time on the school radio, Whose benefit was that for? For Scott's? Or was that meant to help the people on the scene who were trying to help everybody there? Next was Anthony Borges. He suffered massive injuries. And ultimately, again, this is all on the monster, the shooter. But here's what's interesting. We, through him, through the state's case, this interesting concept that none of us would have thought occurred. And that is that kids on the third floor did not hear shots from the second or first floor. Understand that before the fire alarm went off, which was caused by all the shooting that that monster was doing, there were a lot of shots being fired. No one on the third floor heard those shots. And then he goes on the second floor, this monster does. He shoots out of room 1234, and he shoots out the other, it was 1214, the other direction. No one heard those shots. And you know why? You know how we know that? You saw the video, remember on the third floor, of all the kids walking out onto the third floor? They're calm as calm could be. No teacher would let their children walk into the third floor if they thought they were dealing with gunfire. And Borges tells us that. No, I, 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 didn't, I didn't hear any gunfire. And then, when do they hear it? Cruz is right there shooting on the third floor. Next witness was Nicholas Mazzi. He arrived on the west end of the 1200 building. He's with Carl Springs. Every time you say Carl Springs officer, fill in the blank, now you're talking about a different playbook. They have all the real-time intelligence. They know from their dispatch where the shooter is located, that it's just one, that kids are being shot and or killed. They know all that. We established all that. BSO, from all the deputies we called, they didn't know that. So if some of these people look like heroes, it's kind of like someone bragging about getting a great grade on a test, but they had all the answers. You're not smart. You didn't get a good score. Well, you had all the information. You knew it. We didn't. You didn't share it with us. So he testified that he sees Feist dead. He knew it was from inside the building, but he admitted it's because I had the real-time intelligence before he went in. I asked him, did you know whether Carl Springs had ever relayed that information to BSO? He didn't know. And the tragedy is that these well-meaning Carl Springs officers didn't then turn to the BSO officers on the scene and say, here's what we know, because they assumed competence from the higher-ups that either the radios were patched or that the information coming in to Carl Springs would be provided to BSO deputies. That didn't happen. Is that Scott's fault too? 
How dare they not take responsibility for what they didn't do and what they did? Again, my client has that real-time intelligence. One of their call springs officers says, by the way, there's somebody who got killed in room 1213. My client's in. And if he doesn't go in, well, now you've got some really good evidence that my client's putting himself first and didn't go in. But we have none of that evidence. So we're going through the state's case. Still not guilty. No evidence that he knows precisely where the shooter's located. Next witness is Marian Karachenko. He got hit in his leg. And what we got from him is that a teacher hit Rospierski. He's standing right there. He's trying desperately to seek shelter in Rospierski's classroom. And he sees Rospierski getting out his keys. And Rospierski didn't have the keys to open up his classroom door. Now, whose fault is that? Is that my client's fault? So Rospierski, instead of being able to shelter his kids, has to yell, run! That's what we heard. And in the most offensive scenario ever, even though my client ordered a code red to protect all these kids and get them inside the classroom, and all the teachers on that floor, they had their keys, they were able to get the kids inside, but Rospierski left his keys out. So what is so offensive is the state turns around and they charge him criminally with the death and the harm that came from students that Rospierski were not able to allow to be sheltered in his classroom. Objection, judges. The third party only uh, the objection, the objections overruled. Again, ladies and gentlemen, uh, these closing arguments are meant to assist you in your determination of the facts. What the lawyers say is not evidence. You are going to decide what the facts are. Sir, you may proceed. They couldn't get shelter. And also remember with him that when he left the building and he started running, remember his testimony? He still felt he was the target as the shooter was sniper firing out the west side teacher's lounge. And he felt that he wasn't safe. Again, adding to the whole scenario that everywhere around that campus area of the 12, 1300 building, football field, that whole area is a hot zone. He didn't feel safe. Armand Borgi, he was a student on the third floor. He testified that he saw Scott with his gun drawn. My client doesn't do anything? Imagine if my client didn't even pull out his weapon and he's just standing there like this. I'll just wait till SWAT comes, which is essentially what they're saying he did. No, he has his gun out. And I'll get to Burton, but Burton de had him demonstrate that he sees my client in a low, ready position, scanning, looking around. Not, let me just stare at the 1200 building, because that's where I know it's all happening. He's looking. Remember how many people said he was scanning and looking everywhere? That's what they're trained to do. In fact, Armand Borgi specifically told you that when he saw my client, he saw my client looking, quote, west towards the football field. West towards the football field, not glued on the 1200 building, because that's the only place he knows that the shots are coming from. Ashley Hazeltine. She came from Hertzville's class, room 710. She heard what she thought was banging noises. She thought, she's the one student that they got to testify to say that it might have been from the 1200 building. But understand what her testimony was. She didn't say, shots are coming from the 1200 building. Her first thought was, the roof must be collapsing from up there. Remember that? And then she looked, she goes, oh, I didn't see the roof collapse, so I just assumed it was a 1200 building. Okay. Okay. That's her testimony. She did tell you that she would play the echo game right in the very area that my client was at. Remember the echo game before the shooting? because there's a pronounced echo right there where my client took a tactical position of cover. Here's the question. When they had her testify, the issue became 
a parent. They found one student, just one, to testify that she thought the shots were initially a building, top of the building exploding, and then I guess I figured it must have been coming from 1200 building. Remember when I asked Detective Curcio? And I asked him, by the way, about the other students that came out of the 700 building and neighboring 500 building. I asked because we see on that video, you've all seen the video many times, of all the students that are rushing out of the 700 building. We can't see all them from the way the video is you know, positioned, but we do know that every student was not exempt. Every student had to exit their classrooms. It was a fire drill. And so remember when I asked um, uh, Mr. Bonner, how many students would you estimate are in the 700 building and the neighboring 500 building? Remember what the estimate was? I know you wrote it down. 600 to 1,000. That was his testimony. Because okay. again, you've got a school of 3,300 kids. You've got just in those two buildings. I just want to focus on those, just those two buildings for a second. You know that there are other buildings where maybe those students might have heard shots too, and we could find out where they thought the shots were coming from. But let's just focus on, because that's a lot to work with, 600 to 1,000. Remember I asked Detective Curcio, so did you speak to each of the students who came out, the 600 to 1,000? He said, no, that would have been for the lead investigator, Keith Riddick. Okay. So where are those statements? Where did they hear shots from? We want to know. It's in a file. Keith Riddick has it in a file somewhere. Remember when he said that? It has it in a file. OK. I think it's a fair assumption that Keith Riddick isn't, the lead investigator in this case, isn't keeping information from the prosecutors. Objection, Judge. That caliber is Yeah, that's sustained. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't want you to be concerned about witnesses you didn't hear from. I want you to decide the case based on witnesses you did hear from. Go ahead, sir. We do know that Keith Riddick investigated the students who came out of the 700 and 500 building, 600 to 1,000. And from that, the state called one, her, that's it. What you deserve to hear Objection. is... Yeah, that's sustained. No. Judge? Yes, sir. We can go sidebar. No, sir, you may not. Do okay. you have any response to my ruling? We're not going to talk about witnesses that were equally available to both sides. Go ahead, sir. But, but they weren't. That, that, that's what I want to Sir, the objection is sustained. Go ahead. The witnesses you did hear from, which we'll get to in the defense case, made it extremely clear that they couldn't tell where the shots were coming. Carl Springs Officer Best. Carl Springs Officer Best, who came in here and pointed his fingers at my client and tried to make himself out to be some kind of hero. First and foremost, he had all the information that my client didn't have. He knew what was going out over dispatch. He knew where the shooter or shooters were located. And he stood by my client's side. Judge, if we can turn the camera on. Oh, I guess I have to turn this off. Looks like his hands are on his hip. My client's there on his radio, you can see. And Best is literally standing by his side. He comes in here and he points his finger at my client, yet he doesn't go into the building at all. He's standing right there. 30 minutes or so, he's standing by his side. Let's give him the benefit of the doubt. Let's say he didn't know precisely where the shots were coming from. But again, to show you how hypocritical this is and how my client was sacrificed, why is my client being prosecuted when he's standing right next to him and doesn't go in to offer any aid to any of these kids who are bleeding out, who doesn't do anything. He's standing right next to him. Objection, Judge. That's a misstatement of the facts. Uh, the objection's overruled, but again, ladies and gentlemen, you're going to decide what the facts of the case are. Go ahead, sir. What Officer Best did tell you 
was that I ran towards Peterson. I regretted it because I was a sitting duck because the shooter was on a higher ground. So even best, even though he stayed in that position with my client, he felt uncomfortable in that area. Nobody felt safe, which is why my client doesn't then come out from the concrete walls to stand any further unless he's trying to make some transmissions on his defective malfunctioning radio to ensure for the benefit of others that that information gets out. But Best is right there by his side. He said, quote, nobody was in a safe position. And also, Peterson told me shots were fired on the second or third floor. I was blown away because at that point we hadn't heard yet that my client had ordered Morford to go to the building 100 to review the surveillance video. We know my client couldn't tell where their shooter was located because nobody could when you look through the windows of the building. So that would have been quite some time later when my client's getting real-time intelligence or what he thought was real-time intelligence from Jeffrey Morford who's telling him over school radio over a 30-minute period, okay, wait, second floor, no, third floor. It went on and on and on. And so they tried to make it seem that my client knew where the shooter was located and was just sitting there. That didn't happen. Okay, let's go back to, turn that off. Next witness. Oh, don't. The next witness whose face will come up in just a moment is BSO Sergeant Richard Vanderings. He responded after the gunfire, so he wasn't there for that. Okay? He read the CAD notes, remember? He read the CAD notes, notes that my client in real time didn't have access to because he immediately is there on the scene. But the CAD notes, whatever those are, gave him some information that my client didn't have. And he ultimately helped clear on the east side. And he also talked about the radio issues. And he also never spoke to my client about anything. So he doesn't advance their theory that my client knew with certainty that shots were coming from inside the 1200 building. And next one is Tim Burton. If he doesn't prove that this is a selective prosecution, that my client was sacrificed and thrown under the bus, yeah, that's sustained. Can we go sidebar real quick? Officer Burton, let's go through his testimony because he's critical and he's a state witness. He shows up and again he's Carl Spring, so he has access to all the information that my client did not. He arrives at the school and meets with Andrew Medina. Andrew Medina tells him by the front of the school before driving him to the scene in the golf cart that you're looking for a white male, burgundy shirt, ROTC, Black Pants, 1200 building, possibly in the Northeast parking lot. So 1200 building and possibly in the Northeast parking lot with that specific description. 
Burton does not share that information with my client. Burton arrives on the scene, and the first thing he does is he takes a position of cover, just like my client. He is in the first row. So if my client's here, he's in the closest parking area, he said. He's behind a car, the closest one to the 1200 building. He's right there. He said that my client is literally in talking distance. They could hear each other. They didn't have to use radios. They could hear each other. And he asks my client, hey, what do you got? Instead of saying, by the way, here's what I got. I think Burton just assumed that my client knew all of this. But he said, hey, what do we got? My client tells him three things. Remember, I'm sure you wrote it down. Three things. Number one, I don't know where the shots are coming from. He makes that very clear. But why would my client say that to a fellow officer? He's setting up some alibi because he thinks he's going to be prosecuted four years later? He doesn't know. In fact, Tim Burton, who knows my client very well, has utmost respect for him. They're both school resource officers said that it absolutely looked like my client was believable and credible and not making this up in real time. He didn't know where the shooter or shooters were located. Number two, he tells him that he hadn't heard shots in a while. And that was true. Because Burton, had, since he got on the scene, they hadn't heard any shots. Shots had stopped. So my client didn't know where the shots were coming from, and he hadn't heard shots in a while. And third and most significantly, remember what he said? Hey, Burton, watch your back. Watch your back. Now, what's very important about that, and Burton understood that to mean that there's only one meaning there. His back was to the parking lot. On direct, it was a little questionable. I think that I need to clear it up on cross-examination. And it made it very clear that he was facing my client. My client was to the left. He kept an eye on my client for about 20 to 30 minutes while he stayed in a position of cover. His back was to the parking lot, this huge parking lot area. We're talking football field large. And my client's saying, watch your back. If my client knew, as they allege, that the shots were coming from inside the 1200 building and everywhere else is safe, why is he telling Tim Burton to watch his back? Now, he wasn't right. It turns out now we know there wasn't a shooter or shooters roaming the parking lot. But in real time, that's what he believed. So easy after the fact, when you know what that monster did and where he was, to say, oh, you should have done this, should have done that. In real time, the things that he's saying matter. And Tim Burton stays for 20 to 30 minutes watching my client, and he never goes into the 1200 building. Never went in. Next was Stacy LaPelle. Again, this is all in the state's case. State's case. Where's the admission? Where my client says, I knew it, and you know what? I just didn't feel like going in. But, but did you know that there were kids that were going to be harmed? Sure. But I got one foot out of retirement. I'm not going to, I'm, I'm one step away. I'm not going to do anything. That's a different set of facts. None of that happened. Let's keep going with their witnesses. Stacy LaPelle, she was a teacher on the third floor of the 1200 building. She's there inside the hot zone of the hot zone. She said, quote, the sounds that she heard that were ultimately gunfire, the sounds that she heard, it sounded like, quote, it was coming from outside. Where specifically, I asked. Somewhere between the 700 and 1200 building. This is an honest teacher, credible beyond all measure, who's inside the building, where the shots are ringing out on the first floor, second floor. And she's thinking that these shots are coming from outside of the 1200 building. This whole hearing-based prosecution is flawed and offensive, quite frankly. 
Next one. Carl Springs detective, Brett Schroer. He made contact with Scott at 2.41. So the shooting stopped about 2.27.35. And then we're talking now some 15 minutes later or so, 14 to 15 minutes later. He said Scott was on his school radio and relaying intel, intelligence, information of the shooter's location from Morford. That's what he's seeing. So the suggestion that he's doing nothing in real time, which wasn't even mentioned in their closing argument, he's actively trying to get information. If there's no more real-time intelligence, there's no blood, there's no windows with bullets that he can see, there's none of the things that Samaru suggested he should look for, he's now turning to his school radio and BSO radio, hoping at any given moment BSO is going to tell him where to go. He gets nothing from that radio. And he's on the school radio trying to assist what we learned was 10 to 15 officers standing around waiting for his next word who were standing either by the 1200 building or right there by the 700 building, just waiting for Scott to say, okay, the shooter's here. More importantly, he never gives any of the intelligence that he has, the information he has, to Scott. I'm not blaming him. All the Carl Springs officers, I think, erroneously thought that BSO's radios were patched or that they just knew the information. Somehow. Next one. Danny Polo. Who is this guy? Ah, Miguel Suarez. Yeah, I barely recognized him because I didn't ask him any questions. He was a BSO crime scene detective. He took photos of bullet riddled windows. You know what? There is this. I didn't ask him questions, but there is some significance. He. It was he or one of the other crime scene technicians, but we did learn that, for example, Judge, if I can have this on, I will turn this off for one moment. That that monster was shooting at windows. And this classroom in particular, 1234, out that window, if you keep going, you can look at the, the chart, it would head right in Scott's direction. You'll be able to look at it when you, when you take the evidence back. So if Scott is thinking, you know, they might be firing at me, like most of the witnesses thought potentially, again, it's, it's supported by Miguel Suarez and other crime scene technicians' testimony that bullets are hitting windows. I mean, that corroborates the sound evidence that my client's hearing. And so the next one, the next one is Danny Polo, AKA the Masked Ninja. He responded way after the shots were fired. He heard from two deputies on Holmberg Road. We don't know which deputies those were, but he knew from speaking to them that the shooting took place in the 1200 building. Okay, great. So you knew something my client didn't know. And so he went in there and went to save lives. Great. Had my client had that information, he would have been right by your side, Danny. Next one was BSO crime scene technician Danny Kristen. I had no questions for him. He processed the first floor hallway, shell casings. Scott wasn't even there when all those shots were fired. No value. Next one is BSO crime scene technician, or detective Gloria Crespo. She collected 61 shell casings. She took pictures. She also was an SRO. See how they tried to get her? Talk about how she, you know, did acts that could be make her like a caregiver, which we'll talk about, which is preposterous. But there's no value to that. And certainly nothing to suggest that my client knew that the shots were coming from the 1200 building through her testimony. So, so far we keep going. The reason why I put everyone's picture in here and I'm going through their testimony is to remind you that at no time so far should you have an abiding conviction of guilt that this gentleman knew that there are shots coming from inside the building and that children, that adults are being killed. He didn't know that. So let's keep going. 
Edmund DeRosa, Carl Springs captain, he arrived next to Peterson with two other officers at 241. That was long after Cruz was gone, but nobody knew that. And I say nobody. No one like my client and BSO officers. They all thought, well after the shooter left, that there are shooter or shooters still on campus. He's told us that he assumed that the radios were patched. He claimed that he missed the radio transmission about three victims down in the 1216, classroom 1216. He did tell us it was extremely stressful. And here's a captain, okay? He didn't know where the shooter was, he said. He took cover behind a concrete pillar. Why do you do that? Because that's how we're trained. This is a captain telling you he did exactly what my client did, a concrete pillar. He said, quote, Scott seemed frustrated and stressed like everyone else. He said he never shared any of the real time intelligence. He was concerned in the moment, even as he's hiding behind the concrete pillar, that he could be shot at any moment. And he said that my client announced that we're dealing with a 1200 building or somewhere on campus, which is consistently what my client's real time intelligence was. 1200 building or somewhere else on campus. Next one was the medical examiner, Dr. Marlon Osborne. I had no questions for him. But even as the state tried to suggest, you know, with these people who had passed, well, they lived for, you know, a, pretty, a longer period of time. So if my client somehow in one minute and six seconds could know where to go, he could have gotten in there and saved somebody. Remember the testimony, first of all, we first learned it, and I forget which witness it was, it'll come to me, who said, I don't mean to be crass, but when you go into the building, you're actually stepping over bodies. Because your primary object, your goal, is to get to the shooter. So this notion that somehow my client would have saved anyone's life if he somehow could have figured out where to go is without merit. But his testimony was that, unfortunately, Jamie Guttenberg didn't survive very long. Next one was Dr. Boyko, medical examiner. I had no questions for him. He doesn't assist at all with this case on the issue that we're talking about. Oh, boy. Here we go. Here we go, folks. Bootsy. BSO Lieutenant Colonel Samuel Samaru. He somehow came in here and said Scott didn't follow training. But then when I pressured him on cross, well, well, hold on, hold on. I never went to the scene. I never spoke with your client. I never spoke with really anybody. And his training, the things that he does, has nothing to do with what occurred that day. But your client somehow violated training. Lieutenant Colonel, like they brought it out, like up there at the top. What we learned was that he was not being honest and straightforward. Remember the softball question I asked him? I mean, all of our witnesses and, and most witnesses said, yeah, if your client is repeatedly trying to lock down Lock down. Get the school locked down, gentlemen. He's constantly locking down the school. Most reasonable people understand that you want the school locked down because school is letting out for the day. Parents and students and siblings of students and friends are going to flood onto the campus. My client doesn't want any of those people on the campus. Why else would he be doing that other than to save lives? Samaru just couldn't admit the value to that. His keeping students and siblings and parents away helped save lives. We know that Cruz was shooting for two minutes out the teacher's lounge. And if there's more people on campus, there are more deaths. It's black and white. In hindsight, if he knew that there was a shooter inside the 1200 building, he may have said, OK, let's lock it down. Keep parents, kids out. But everybody, storm the 1200 building. That's what he would have said if he knew it. He didn't know in real time. So him locking down 
the school helped prevent parents from coming on. In fact, it was Burton who said it was eerie. It was like a ghost town. Thank you, Scott Peterson. Thank you. Because remember how the shooter looked? He wasn't a big, bad monster dressed like something unusual. He blended in. So the last thing you wanted were more students, more siblings of students coming on to the, to the, to the school, either on the football field or in the parking lot, wandering around so that you can't figure out who's a shooter and who's a student and who's a parent. But Samaru couldn't admit that to you folks. He couldn't do it. Very disturbing. What's his vested interest? He's the training guy. And what we learned was his training had almost little to do with what they were going through that day. We learned from Deputy Perry that most of his trainings didn't last more than five minutes. And that they were all contained within a building, typically even on a floor of a building, where there's tape up. And everybody knows the shooter's there somewhere. You just have to find him in the few little corridor areas or the couple of rooms. That's not what they experienced here. Not one single witness testified that we were talking about, you know, in our training, you know, multiple football fields in either direction as to where the shooter or shooters may be located. To this minute, we all are still unclear on what you're supposed to do. If you listen to Samuel, remember what he said? Well, if your client thought it might have been the 1300 building, which we know that he did, because it's right there in his recording, then, well, he should have started there. Really? Well, let's play that out for a second. My client goes from the 700 building and then starts to run football fields away to the 1300 building. Now, I'm going to say this with love. He's in, he was in definitely decent shape. Objection, Judge. He had a staff burn entrance. Yeah, that's sustained. Go ahead, sir. You can consider his age, which the prosecutor told you what it was, and you could consider what it would be like for him to start running to the 1300 building. Now, let's say he did that. So I asked Samaru, should, should he start with going to the top because he thinks maybe there might be somebody up there shooting? Does he start on the third floor? Does he start on the first floor? Does he start on the east side of the 13th Does he west side? Does he go to the north? It's preposterous, like literally looking for a needle in the haystack. But Samaru said, you start on the first floor. Okay, let's play that out for a second. So he runs all the way there, and meanwhile, let's say he gets there, and now the shooter or shooter is that he's concerned about in the parking lot, Jump up, remember we told Bert, watch your back, and they start shooting people. Even Remy talked about how she didn't feel safe in the 700 building because she thought people might come into her classroom. So let's say that happened. Now he's out of position. He's all the way down in the 1300 building, eagerly waiting for someone to give him some real-time intelligence. But no, he left his position. He's running, even though there could be fire coming from any direction. He could be dead at any given moment because he has no idea where the shooter or shooters are located. He's supposed to go to the 1300 building? Now he's completely out of play. People are dead, and they say, why did you leave your position of cover? You should have waited for real-time intelligence. He was damned no matter what. He couldn't win. Facts don't matter when you're sacrificed. To Samaru, to suggest with a straight face he should have just run to the 1300 building? Preposterous. Next witness was Dr. Terrell Topps, a medical examiner. No value to the issue that, at hand. And next was Kelvin Greenleaf. He's the one who told us that Andrew Medina said nothing to either one of them. And that could have changed everything. Just tell us that you know that Cruz went into that building and started shooting. Just tell us. Greenleaf was extremely upset, rightfully so. He only heard four to five shots. Not 70, he heard four to five, that's it. Most people heard very few shots. He thought it was a 1200 building. He thought it was a 1200 building, but he said he never shared that with Scott. 
He said that it was a very long process when he went to the video room. Long. In fact, Morford said it wasn't five to ten minutes. It was much longer than that. It was a long process. He also said that he saw Scott scanning back and forth, looking left and right to try to find where the shooter or shooters were located. Here's another person, just like Stobley, who said that it looked to them as they're standing there like my client was looking and scanning and trying to find out in real time where the shooter or shooters are located. You know, the very thing that they're claiming he wasn't doing. He didn't try to seek out. He didn't do anything. And his exact words, ladies and gentlemen, hopefully you wrote this down. Let me remind you what he said. His exact words, quote, I don't think, regarding where the shooter or shooters were located, he said, quote, I don't think Peterson knew what was going on. Because he didn't. Because they failed him. They didn't give him the real-time intelligence. He couldn't tell from the sounds. There was nothing that he could see visually. Carl Springs never shared the real-time intelligence. But to him, we get out of their state witness. He didn't know what was going on. He didn't know. Former campus monitor Elliot Bonner, he saw Feist down on the west side, something my client couldn't see. On direct, he said he thought it was coming from the 1200 building. Then on cross, remember? I think it was around the 1200 building. And then again, his final word, when confronted with his statement, was, oh, I'm, not, I'm not sure. But he never tried to call Peterson and give him any real-time intelligence. Would have helped, been helpful to my client to know that somebody was shot. Anybody. He doesn't know at that point. Vice is down. They know it. My client doesn't. Next witness by Zoom, Dr. Wendelin Sneed, a medical examiner. She offered nothing on the issue. Next one, Dr. Rebecca McDougal, no questions. Talked about Scott Beagle and Kara Logren's death. They tried to suggest through the questioning, well, they, they, how long did they survive? No, it was a quick, rapid death, unfortunately. So again, nobody could have saved them. Next witness was Sunrise Lieutenant Craig Cardinal. He first arrives, and he sees BSO officers in a position of cover, who's saying, don't go in that building, because he was shooting from that building. Interesting, who they talked to, to know it was that building. But apparently, there are deputies who know that information and are telling them that. My client, there's no evidence that he knows that information. Now, he went in because his son was there. Whole different level. And he also is from Carl Sp I'm sorry, he's from Sunrise. And he had information that my client did not. He said that he saw my client and how he was acting. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh. There was genuine concern, genuine dismay, because they were bringing out for the first time bodies from the building. And that my client was freaking out. A normal human response to that. His kids had been shot. And their final witness, we're at the final witness. At no point did they prove this case beyond a reasonable doubt. We're at the final witness who only raised more reasonable doubts. He's the lead detective in the Cruz case. He discussed the role of the lead detective. He kept referring to Keith Riddick. Every time I asked him, well, who did this? Who did that? Keith Riddick. Keith Riddick. Why? Because Keith Riddick is the lead detective in this case. When he arrived to the scene, he had, quote, no idea what was going on in the school. He said, I tried to get intelligence. He helped us with the times to make sure that Vice was shot at 223.25, that Scott announces immediately at 223.26, one second later, which caused all the cops to come. If it wasn't for my client immediately announcing at 223.26, all the response from at least BSO would not have happened. Thank you for doing that, Scott. And in his statement, in his statement, they charged him with perjury. Perjury. 
Based upon this, Judge, if I can get to Elmo. <coughs> By the way, I'm talking about perjury, but I'm looking right up above, too. This is important. This is not an interview that my client thinks will ever result ever with him being charged criminally or even under investigation. They just brought him in because, hey, you were a witness. We need to, it's not a debriefing either. That's a separate thing. He says, debriefing would be very detailed. And what's the next thing? What's the next thing? What's the next thing? We want to know everything, everything. This is just some questions. But even in that, he says that he heard shots. Question, okay, could you tell what floor it was coming from? I, I thought it was outside. It was so loud. All right? And so close. I thought it was probably outside. I didn't even think it was even inside the building because it was so clear and loud. This mirrors what every witness that we called to the stand said. It was so clear and loud. Nobody thought it was inside except for a few random people that we've already mentioned. I knew it was close to this building, but I wasn't even sure if it was in the building, was, was it outside the building, but I knew it was close. And by the way, remember he said that he did this interview in a chronological order, okay? So, and what happened next, right? We got a little bit of that. So, next line over here, we're getting to the, the one where it said, ah, okay, all right. When you uh, get closer and you hear those, I'm going to move this, up. this is the perjury count right here. It's the only time he asks him about shots. Remember, I said, "You ever ask him how many total shots did you hear from beginning to end?" Nope, never asked that. Didn't you think that that was going to be the money shot? Meaning the right question to ask if we're going to charge him with intentionally lowering the number of shots. And by the way, my client does say. First, he says up here that there could be firecrackers. I think we have shots fired. And then again, again he reports that there are shots fired. Here, right here. At 2.26.40, he again says, I hear shots fired, shots fired. So he's hearing additional shots fired. He's reporting it here. He knows this is recorded. Why would he tell an officer he only heard the initial shots when it's right here recorded? It's because the cop is asking you about, as you get close to the building, how many shots did you hear? This is the question. Okay, all right. Once you uh, get closer and you hear those guys, guys, what are you talking about? Remember he said, I don't know. It should be on some recording somewhere. Okay, well, here you are sitting. I'm giving my closing argument. We still don't even know what he's talking about. So either he's talking about some guys or it's some mistake in the transcript. So you then are being asked by the state, who didn't clarify what that means when I raised it, to rely upon a transcript that's not even accurate to convict my client of perjury. But look at the context. All right, OK. Uh, once you get uh, closer, so he's setting it up. Once you get closer, he's referring closer to the building. Once you get uh, closer and you hear those guys, whatever that means, how many rounds do you think you heard? And he says, it wasn't many, two or three. He's dead on accurate because Aaron Feist, which is the first shots he hears, was shot twice. And what's left out of the charging document is this next line. OK, all right, what happens from there? I stop immediately, right on my BSO radio, shots fired, shots fired. Does that not make it clear the context in which he's asking these questions? It's crystal clear. If we can see it, how come they can't see it? And then the other one was about not seeing kids come out of the building. First of all, who are these five kids? There's been no testimony that ever these five kids ran towards my client. There's a big pillar 
and a big metal fence, he definitely would have missed them. In that moment, at 223.55, he's worried about kids getting into the building, he's on both radios, he's hearing what could be possibly shots fired, Greenleaf sees the kids, my client doesn't. So what? What is he, why would he lie about that? In a situation when there wasn't the chance that he was gonna get arrested, or even questioned, it makes no sense that perjury count is consistent with meritless charges being brought against my client. So that was the state's case. That's it. That's it. That's it. Where is the proof beyond a reasonable doubt that my client, who's still asking, still asking at 229, still wondering, Perry, does he know where the shooter is? And still, at 245, between the 12 and 1300 buildings, the last time we heard shots. It's right there. It's there. It's clear as day. So we didn't have to call any witnesses. And it would have been really, really strong if I just said, you know what, Scott? Even though we have all these defense witnesses, let's not call anybody. They didn't meet their burden. They didn't prove this case. And at the risk of you thinking that somehow we have any burden at all, we decided to put on witnesses. And now you know why. We needed to call those witnesses so you learned about the pronounced echo and all the kids and adults, faculty, staff, teachers, who did not know where the shots were coming from. Let's review that. I mean, none of those witnesses were addressed by the prosecutor in her closing. I'm assuming that my zealous advocate, who I admire, will come up here and say something about it. I guess she did say, I'm why did you? And that's the commentary. Yeah. Did yeah. Mr. Agosh, that's the stain. Let's not talk about the lawyers. Let's talk okay. about the facts, evidence, and testimony well, in the case. Go ahead, sir. The prosecutor said to you, why would they call kids to relive a disturbing experience? Well, because they're accusing my client of knowing where the shots are coming from. That's pretty relevant. Pretty relevant. You would want to hear from kids. Having kids come in and relive a horrible experience and talk about injury when we're conceding and saying that's not even an issue, well, it cuts both ways. So here's the defense case. And every defense witness was beyond reproach. Everybody was credible. Objection, Judge Counsel, is vouching. Yeah, that's sustained. You all can determine. There were no conflicts in their testimony. You looked at them in the eyes, and we started with Melanie Hertzfeld. What was interesting was she testified in the state's case because she, we had to accommodate her. So before they even rested their case, you started to learn, wait a second, it's not as clear as they're suggesting. Melanie Hertzfeld, whose classroom is literally facing the 1200 building, on the first floor, she hears shots fired. And she thought they were fireworks, and she said those sounds are coming from the football field. From the football field. She's in building 700, and she's hearing shots fired from the football field outside. If that was the only witness we put forward saying that, you would immediately say, yeah, how can they rely upon a sound-based prosecution under those circumstances? But there was more, as you heard. Anna Ramos, he ordered the code red. Do you guys understand the significance of that? How in real time, he doesn't just order the shots, hey, shots fired. He goes to a school radio, standing out there for an additional 18 seconds without his vest, further jeopardizing his life to ensure that these kids are locked down. That's uncontroverted. He didn't neglect these kids. He made them his priority. Michael Kratz, Deputy Michael Kratz. 36 years in law enforcement. He heard Scott announce possible shots fired. That's why he came to the scene. And when he got to the scene, he heard four to five gunshots. He was so convinced that the shots were coming from the football field 
Then he gets on his BSO radio to let everybody know. Shots fired at the football field. When he makes that announcement, what's key is Cruz had not even begun his sniper firing out of the teacher's lounge on the west side. He was in the middle of the hallway of the third floor, still contained in the building. Yet he thought, as he's by the football field, that the shots were coming from the football field and that the shooter or shooters were literally 30 to, feet, 30 to 40 feet in front of him. How do you reconcile that? Cops aren't trained, by the way, in having some special ability to know where shots are coming from. When they leave the mall and they're not sure exactly where they parked their car and they hit their alarm, they can't quicker, more quickly, get to their vehicle faster than any of us non-police officers. They don't train them for that. And in this instance, he believed the shots were coming from the football field and put it out over the radio. So imagine that, when my client's trying to figure out in real time, okay, wait, I think it's 1200 building, maybe 1300 building, maybe parking lot, and all of a sudden he's hearing on his BSO radio, shots fired from the football field. Wait, shots fired, oh, oh wait. Are there more shooters? Did the shooter leave? Are there others? He's trying to figure all this out in real time. And in response, he's saying, all right, 26, referring to Kratz's announcement, also heard it, it's over by inside the 1200 building. Not inside the 1200 building, like the prosecutor kept saying. By inside the 1200 building. By, both are on his mind. By, exactly what Burton thought, by the parking lot area, all the areas around that, including the 1300 building, or inside. All that's in play. And yes, if we could turn back the clock, if he could turn back the clock, he would have picked a place, and maybe he gets lucky, and he goes into the 1200 building, and we're not here. But you can't go back and prosecute him for what we know now. Kratz, like all the officers, took their time, got, not took their time, but took the time to get his vest, to get his rifle. He said his radio was staticky and not working properly. He was also worried about sniper fire. He wasn't the only one considering it. And no one who was worried about sniper fire is trained to get on the radio. By the way, I'm worried about sniper fire. Oh, and I'm also worried about 15 other things. This isn't therapy. You don't give your thoughts about what you're thinking so that somehow you could use it in your defense when you're prosecuted years later. It doesn't work that way. He took a position of cover behind a car, just like my client did, took a position of cover, and he saw Carl Springs officers taking positions of cover. You know, the officers who had all that real-time intelligence, they were taking cover too. Next witness was Lieutenant Michael DeVita. He knew Scott for 10 years as an excellent award-winning officer. He's the one who testified that within two years, in 2016, so two years before this happened, he won Deputy of the Year in Parkland. The year before that, he was School Resource Officer of the Year. So from all that, even though he jumped in the middle of fights with kids to break it up without backup, we heard all about that, he investigated, he had more arrests than anybody, we heard that. This guy was active, involved, courageous, heroic, and all of a sudden, what, he turns into a coward? Doesn't care about kids anymore? That's their theory. But he said that the radios weren't working through the throttling. He responded with Captain Jan Jordan, and that DeVita complained to supervisors about the radios for quite some time, and they did nothing, nothing. My client didn't pick the radios that he had to use. And understand the radios would have then afforded him the opportunity to get some extra information to come in that he wasn't getting. You heard about officers having real-time intelligence, like, oh, I see bullet holes here on the west side. You know, my client's on the east side, so we can't see that. People trying to key up, and they couldn't get that information out to them. They couldn't get out that Aaron Feist was down. You look, and that nowhere on his transcription through dispatch, do you see that coming to Scott? He said he had no idea where the shooters were. 
He also believed in the plus one rule, that if you think that there's one shooter, assume that there's two. If you think there's five, think that there might be six. They didn't know. He didn't know. He saw Scott on his school radio diligently trying to obtain information from Morford. He wasn't passive. He's actively trying to get that real-time intelligence. And he's the one, by the way, who said there were 12 to 15 people by the 700 building and the 1200 building waiting for my client to give him, give them, the real-time intelligence that he's getting over school radio. He was the guy. That was his job. Were you supposed to stop and abandon Morford at any moment? He didn't know it was going to take 30 minutes. He thinks at any moment they're going to be able to look, rewind the tape, boom, there's a shooter. He tells him, and everybody knows to go. But another failed scenario, another set of facts that didn't bode well for Scott. He didn't get that information, and it was through no fault of his. And worse, it was old information because they didn't rewind it properly. Oh, wait, i got to bring up one thing. During his cross-examination, it was my friend, Mr. Killoran, who questioned him, well, why didn't he go to the video room? He brought that up, that my client should have somehow, if the radios weren't working properly, he should have left the hot zone, which would have been ideal, because now he's no longer worried about sniper firing, people wandering around with guns, God knows what. He should go run a football field or two away to the 100 building, wait for about a half hour, find out you know, where the shooter's located, and then run all the way back like an American ninja, all the way to the 7-800 corridor to then relay information. That suggestion is ridiculous. He stayed in the hot zone, to his credit, to try to relay the information that he was getting in real time from Jeffrey Morford. Suzanne Campbell, the first of several teachers who testified, or one of several teachers who testified. She was inside the 700 building. She heard loud noise pops. She thought that fireworks were being thrown at us, the first of many people who talked about how they believed this was very personal, that it was coming at them. She said she thought the building was going to collapse. Not there were shots coming from inside the 1200 building, but she thought the building was going to collapse. Her building. She said it was so loud and echoey, it was bouncing off the buildings. One thing you can relate to, I was trying to come up with a metaphor, like what would this be like? And this is a good example, I think. Hopefully it resonates. You're allowed to use your common sense and life experiences, okay? You're driving along, and you hear a siren. You know you're supposed to take action, but you don't know where the siren's coming from. Yeah, that's the thing. If a person's driving along, and they hear a siren, and that person doesn't know where the siren's coming from, you think, well, you know what? My hunch is that it's going to be up there in the um, intersection. Or, oh, no, it's behind me. OK. now. That's the thing with sounds, loud sounds. But now you add an echo, like Susan Campbell talked about, and it's impossible. Next witness. And these are defense witnesses. Imagine if we just rested our case. You never would have heard of this information. But we chose to call these witnesses. And Tyler Jabot was extraordinary. He was an 11th grader in the 700 building. He evacuated. And he saw Scott looking, quote, towards the football field. Another person who sees my client looking west, corroborating that Deputy Kratz who had said football field. Hmm. And he said he heard three to four shots. They could have been firecrackers. He was about 30 to 40 feet from Scott when he heard the shots. Think of how close he is. He said he didn't know where the shots were coming from. He thought it was from the west side stairwell of the 700 building. He thought from that direction. And then when questioned, he said, well, I also thought it could have been from the senior parking lot. I mean, all over the place. He didn't know. He said it echoes quite a bit due to the concrete. Assistant Principal Jeffrey Morford. He heard Scott order a code red. I asked Curcio, I think it was Curcio and a few others, how many people had school radios? How many? 30, 40, 50, 60? Who had a school radio? 
How many of those people heard Scott order a code red? So that's not even an issue. I'll leave it as a question mark, because we don't know. Lack of evidence. It would be great if we had that information, and then that's not in dispute. But here it's got out of the code red, for the benefit of the children, including, but not limited to, the very ones he's accused of neglecting. He said that it's not uncommon to miss announcements or transmissions on the school radio. He also said that he heard Max Rosario. Give me one second, Mr. How much time do I have? 10 minutes. Okay. I'm going to have to rush through this, okay? Jeffrey Morford. Judge, can I have additional time to pause for some time? I just need you may not, sir. Okay. Go ahead. Well, I, I'm going to have to talk quickly then, folks. Okay. Jeffrey Morford, he was in there for a long time in that room. My client was diligent in trying to get the information out. There was no hesitation in what he was doing. Melanie Weber was in the 11th grade, Hertzfield's class. She heard gunshots. She thought they were firecrackers, echoing and reverberating. Sounds were coming from the soccer field, which we later know and also learned is the football field. She also thought it was all the way over there. She didn't even hear Kratz's announcement over the radio and thought they were coming from the soccer field, the football field. And then on redirect, she said sounds were coming from everywhere, everywhere. Brian Miller, 36 years with the SO. She was, he responded because of Scott's transmissions. He heard several shots, thought they were coming from the football field, reverberating. Deputy Kratz, he heard the announcement. The radios malfunctioned. He said that he was never debriefed, and that brought up the issue of Colonel Poland, the highest ranking person on the scene. Never debriefed him, others, my client, even though the active shooter policy that we put into evidence says that that shall be done in a timely manner. It was never done. Maximo Rosario, he was 30 feet from the 1200 building. He was even closer than Scott, who was 75 feet, according to Curcio. He heard five to six shots, thought it was firecrackers, although he's familiar with gunfire, because he, he owns a permit. He couldn't tell where the shots were coming from. The senior, large, the senior lot is huge, 500 cars. And he saw Scott in a position of cover on his radio, doing something. Ruby Harris, she thought that the shots we're coming from, she was between the seven and 1200 building, right there, somewhere in the senior lot. Somewhere in the senior lot. Coincidentally, her sister, who has the same DNA, who is in the same area, who was on the grass, right there with her, she heard the shots and thought it was at the football field. Two women who live in the same house, right on the same grass, thought it was in two completely different places. Sergeant Goolsby, that was Perry Harris, Sergeant Goolsby, he heard shots, he thought they could be on the west of the football field, ground level between the 12 and 1300 building, he got no intel, he was never debriefed, he never knew the kids were shot in that building. Gotta keep rushing, Cindy Helberson, huge echo in that area, area, she couldn't tell whether it was inside or outside. By the way, none of these witnesses ever said that they thought the shots were coming from inside the 1200 building. None. That objection is overruled. Again, ladies and gentlemen, you all will decide what the facts of the case are. Not one of these defense witnesses ever told you that they thought the shots were coming from inside that building. Again, Cindy Helberson, she couldn't narrow it down. She definitely didn't think the shots were coming from inside. Dylan Redshaw, she thought it was a bomb. She said the sound was all around me that she immediately turned towards the football field. Angela Mize, she talked about how offensive it was that these systems weren't patched. They should have been patched. Rennie was great because she had a student come back and say that he had heard shots, uh, not shots, but firecrackers inside the 1200 building. And so she has that information, just like my client does. Firecrackers in the 1200 building. But when she hears the shots, she doesn't think they're coming from inside. She immediately thinks that, and, and here's Scott, you know, get back, by the way. She thinks that it was coming from the grassy area between the 700 and the 1200 building. Josh Stumbach, 
He thought it was anywhere, anywhere in front of him. He was at the north side of the campus, anywhere. This is a 45-acre campus, anywhere. He couldn't narrow it down. Samantha Oakley said she was ready, willing, and able to patch the radios. All she needed was either Coral Springs or someone from BSO, her own agency, to say, go ahead and do it. Boop, boop, boop. Takes three seconds. Nothing. Nobody asked her to do it. And Alexander Wind, he said he thought that he was 30 feet from the building. He thought that a bomb was exploding in the area. He never thought it was in the 1200 building. He said there's a huge echo in that area. Arthur Perry, the final witness, who the state cross-examined and made him look like he did something wrong when he was just so close to that building. Remember that photo? It's in evidence. I don't have time to pull it up. My plan was to show you. He's in a position of cover with Captain Jan Jordan. The 1200 building's right there. He sees kids coming out of the building. He sees Fife's body on the floor. He sees bullet holes. He sees people going in, and he still told you why he didn't think it had anything to do with the 1200 building. You know when he learned it was the 1200 building and the kids were injured in there? 7 p.m. that night when he had left the scene and he was watching Fox News. That's when he learned. You know, my client's supposed to know that when he's on the scene. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm, almost, I'm virtually out of time. This notion of him being a caregiver is ludicrous. He's supposed to read Miranda to kids as a law enforcement officer and then say, by the way, don't answer that question because I'm your caregiver. This could affect you in the future. He's not a caregiver. He's a police officer. And he's assigned to the school pursuant to that contract, but he is not there to make sure that their bellies are full and that they are hydrated properly. That idea is ludicrous. Now you're going to see the charging document and understand that when you have your eye, you know, the, the options, that not guilty is the only way to go in this case. And what not guilty means is not proven. You didn't prove this case beyond into the exclusion of every reasonable doubt. The burden of proof is on the state, and if you think, well, maybe, maybe he knew where the shots were coming from, or possibly, or probably, or it's highly likely, uh-uh. The only time you ever find anyone guilty is when they prove the case beyond into the exclusion of every reasonable doubt. That's why I tell you that your decision is very easy. This is a five minute not guilty. You do not owe anybody, again, you can take as long as you want, but you do not owe anybody any extra time in that room. You sit there and say, they never proved their case. Not guilty hopefully means that you believe that he's innocent, but it also just means not proven. Ladies and gentlemen, I conclude by telling you that this is the most difficult time because the prosecutor gets up here and he's going to tell you things. Just ask yourself what I would say in response and use your own common sense. Understand that sympathy plays no role. Understand this is a very easy decision, and we're all counting on you to make a wise and legal decision. And I also want you to remember the victims. Just remember them. Understand that Nicholas Cruz is the one responsible, and that we do not do justice for the victims Objection. by doing an injustice against Scott Peterson. Yeah, that's, that's sustained. That is Ladies an and inappropriate gentlemen. remark, sir. Yeah. That, that request is granted. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to completely disregard the last sentence that the uh, attorney just said to you. Go ahead, sir, your final word. I will conclude by telling you that the case is now in your hands, and every minute that this is open without a not guilty verdict is a miscarriage of justice. You know what the evidence is. You know what it's not. And the only verdict, the only verdict that speaks the truth in this case, and I've got to address, oh my goodness, him not testifying. You all promised you wouldn't hold it against him. One scenario was if they rested their case and they didn't prove it, you wouldn't hold it against him. We're counting on you. Wanting to hear from him, you can talk to him if you want, anytime after this case. But needing to hear from him, you all said you wouldn't hold it against him, and he could take advice from an attorney, and if they didn't meet their burden, he wouldn't need to take that stand. We saw what that pit bull prosecutor did with Perry. Nobody should have to go through that. No one. The only verdict that speaks justice in this case, ladies and gentlemen, is not guilty on every single count because he truly is innocent and did everything he could that day. On behalf of Scott, I thank all of you. Thank you.